the founder of Space Hipsters. So, so ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm EA welcome for her first visit to Emily Carney. All right, well, hello, Wisconsin. Good evening, we're gonna have a great night tonight. Uh, before I start my remarks, I just wanna say a, a big party thank you to EAA for inviting me to this incredible event. I, I've had a time like no other. Um, I do wanna remark a little bit on how this panel is gonna operate. What's gonna happen is um, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna introduce the guest tonight. I'm gonna ask some questions and then uh, hopefully the last 30 minutes of the show tonight we can dedicate to, um, uh, or the last uh, last part of the show we can dedicate to uh, audience questions. So, uh, like uh, Chris said earlier, if you do have uh, questions, please text them to the code that will uh, be shown. So, all right. So, let's set the scene. As the Apollo program receded into the distance, NASA looked to the idea of living and working in space. The Apollo missions took crews to the moon, uh, landed upon the lunar surface, and came back within a few short days. As the 1960s gave way to the 1970s, NASA's priorities started to shift. The space agency developed and built the most complex flying machine ever devised, the Space Transportation System, or better known as the Space Shuttle. An orbiter would launch with an external tank and two boosters, would be capable of a variety of diverse purposes, it would land like an airplane on a runway. As time passed, the system grew larger and more complicated. Many doubted it would work. Uh, I personally think the space shuttle is probably uh, one of the most experimental aircraft ever. The Enterprise approach and landing tests of 1977 validated the idea that a heavy glider could land on a runway, and 40 years ago on April 12, 1981, uh, Columbia's first launch opened a whole, world, a whole new world of opportunity and space flight. Columbia, along with its siblings Challenger, Discovery, Atlantis, and Endeavor, flew 135 missions. The space shuttle program developed a or deployed a variety of essential payloads encompassing commercial satellites, uh, communication satellites, deep space probes, and even space telescopes that opened up our view of the universe. Moreover, it allowed the United States to expand the promise of 1975's Apollo-Soyuz mission, meeting up with other nations' astronauts and cosmonauts in low Earth orbit via the Space Lab program, the Shuttle Mir program, and the International Space Station. Those who discount, or I'm sorry, multiple programs now have the capable, capability to work together in space thanks to the ISS. Uh, those who discount the shuttle program brush off the thousands of hours dedicated to the program not only in space, but also on Earth by its legions of workers, engineers, and technicians. While the shuttle program ended it, itself ended a decade ago this month, its legacy still continues to unfold. Uh, today, the International Space Station still orbits overhead, giving its partnership countries a chance to accomplish real space science on an orbiting scientific platform. Uh, we look forward to future deep space missions that will take humans further into the unknown for longer and longer periods of time with an eye cast upon the moon currently. Uh, no deep space mission will be possible without the research and development accomplished with the Space Shuttle Program and the ISS. But let me introduce you to the pioneers of the Space Shuttle Program. Uh, first we have Jim Voss. STS-44, STS-53, STS-69, STS-101, STS-102. And STS-105. Next, we have Steve Lindsay, STS-87, STS-95, which was John Glenn's return to flight. We'll probably talk about that a little bit tonight. Uh, STS-104, STS-121, and STS-133. And we have Paul Dye, who is the longest serving flight director, Iron Flight, 
and NASA's history with over 40 years of aviation experience as an engineer, builder, and pilot. He's also the author of the recently released Shuttle Houston Life in the Center Seat of Mission Control. So let's get started. Sorry, I'm a little short here. All right, so let's talk, um, let's open the panel by talking about the beginning of the space shuttle program a little bit. Uh, let's talk a little bit about shuttle development uh, before it actually was launched in 1981. So can each of you maybe talk a little bit about the milestones that had to be reached before Columbia was launched on April 12th, 1981? Let's start. Go ahead, go ahead. Let's start. <laughs> Uh, well, let's see, you know, the shuttle program started, uh, they started doing the development um, around the end of the Apollo program, kind of going into the skydive program around the, the early 70s, uh, started developing it. Um, and it went on, and, and actually, a lot of people don't realize that the shuttle, it was originally designed to build a space shuttle with a space station. They were going to do both of those things at the same time. So they wanted this shuttle to go into the space station even back then. But the shuttle was also a joint program between and the Department of Defense. And so, for example, the, the size of the payload bay that they designed was designed for national security space payloads, space satellites to put into orbit at those times. And so the actual size of the shuttle was really dictated by that requirement. It was originally designed to obviously serve NASA. We were going to fly 60 times a year uh, for these missions where we just go up and down what's called blue suit instead of white suit maintenance. And uh, it was going to you know, revolutionize uh, space transportation be very routine. But then they're also building a second uh, launch location out of Vandenberg Air Force Base, and the Air Force was going to use it for, uh, for the missions that they needed to do. And so the design started, and uh, you know, even to this day, I'm amazed at the design and how capable that vehicle is. It, it was such a capable spacecraft on what it could do. But they did the design, they did, they did as much testing as they could, and the first vehicle they built was, uh, was the uh, um, Enterprise, and it was just a uh, design to fly in the atmosphere. And if you ever saw the pictures of uh, the shuttle launching off the, seven, off the back of the 747 and coming in and flying to the landing, it was designed to do that. However, they didn't do it automated. They uh, actually put crew in there, and unfortunately, Joe Engel is going to be here tonight. He was one of those pilots, so he could obviously talk about it much better than I was. But that was a critical test to prove that aerodynamically this this glider that, for those of you that, uh, everybody here flies airplanes, but you, you probably know you probably know what your L over D is of your aircraft or flight glider, gliders, you know what that is. The L over D of the shuttle is four. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really not, I used to tell my kids, if, if you ever had kids and played with Buzz Lightyear, it didn't really fly, it mostly just was falling with style. So, um, but uh, we, had, we had a test that was a very successful test. And then they got ready to fly the first flight in 1981 with uh, uh, John Young and Bob Crippen. And again, the first flight was crewed. They had people on it. And uh, talk about a risky first flight that was one. So, Paul? Well, I'll tell you, my, my first memory was I joined NASA in 1980 and as a co-op student. And um, I remember, and, and, and they assigned me to this operations team. I didn't know what that was. It turned out to be initial control. And, and we were on the same floor, third floor, of before as the uh, astronaut office, they had well, half of it, we had the other. So not only am I just now working at NASA, but I'm sharing a, sharing a restroom with astronauts. I mean, this is pretty cool. And now he knows that's not really so great. It's not, yeah, not so great. Okay. <laughs> but, but I distinctly remember walking into the stairwell, and John Young was standing there, he, became, he was the commander of the first shuttle. This was short, shortly before his case one, was talking with a couple other astronauts who I didn't know at the time. And they were laughing about they had this F-15 go up with show tiles on the belly, and they did put a little disturbance on it. And he said, and I can remember him saying, and they just came off like a zipper. <laughs> and and this was shortly before first flight. But you could tell he was basically saying, you know, sooner or later we're just going to have to go fly this thing and see what it's going to do. And and that's really the first memory I have of of uh, of John and and how he was just kind of like, well, you know, we're going to have to do this at some point. Yeah. You know, everything was new and everything was better with the space shuttle. They were really pushing the state of the art and the technologies. 
especially in the engines, what well, everything was different. We were flying a glider that had all these tiles on it that were, were new. We were using solid rocket motors and uh, high performance engines. And the engines were something I had a chance to take a look at. I worked at the Marshall Space Flight Center one summer working in their engine program, and everything was failing. Every time they did a test, they would burn up an engine. The pumps were just not able to pump the, the really cold liquids using a very hot turbine uh, to do that. It was mixing them up, and you put uh, the really hot gases with the, the you know, cold hydrogen and oxygen, and you get fires, and they burned up a lot of engines. But they solved all those problems. They accomplished uh, all these high technology developments to, you know, to make a vehicle that was just incredible. And it took thousands of people to do that through the development program, and then the, the building of the, the space shuttles, and then the operations of it, the training of the crews, the crews to go fly them, and people to operate the space shuttles on orbit. And I think I saw a couple of people that actually had worked in our shuttle program out there, and they, they made they may be able to say we're lying about some things tonight, but to make sure they're on our side. I, if you don't mind, I'd like to have all those folks that have had anything to do with the space shuttle program to stand up. Let's see how many people out there. And thank you very, thank you very personally for making them safe for when we flew. Yeah. Okay, now here's a question for the, uh, for the astronauts. So, when did your interest in uh, aviation begin? What kinds of planes and programs did you participate in that led you up to uh, NASA? Uh, well, for me, you know, I was just a little kid and uh, I went on. I remember a little kid when I was on Apollo TV and uh, uh, watching on the old black and white team. Uh, you know, I call it us, uh, you know, we're really not out as I don't know, it's an orbit point call all that. I think we all, and the astronaut, at that, but, uh, as a kid, I really wanted, all wanted a kid, I don't know, I don't know. But what I started, I wanted to do is fly airplane. I always did, uh, you know, when I was, so I always wanted to uh, stand up. But I had to do, hey, uh, 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 I couldn't figure out the damn thing. And, and uh, but as an engineer, uh, I'll be an engineer. All. And so, my dad, uh, I wanted to be my sophomore year of school, we took a basketball school trip to Colorado. I grew up in high school in California. I went to this, uh, uh, called the Air Force place I'd never heard of. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, one of my teachers said, uh, Steve, pay attention to the tour because and he said, I think this is where you need to go to this. And uh, so, where you did, it, uh, I figured, well, uh, gosh, if I go there and I saw uh, the school, I can uh, maybe get to fight pilot training. To the uh, and I get an engineering degree, so I ended up, uh, they got my paperwork mixed up to somebody else's, and somehow I got selected to go to the Air Force Academy. So I went out there and, and did that, and then, uh, so graduated, and went to pilot training as an Air Force pilot, and then I, uh, became a fire pilot in the Air Force, so I was flying uh, airplanes, and really, up to that point, I hadn't flown anything. I, I flown a little, uh, T-41, uh, my senior year at the Air Force Academy, but had never flown anything else. I flew gliders also, but not much. And then I just went right into jets, started flying. So I was fighter pilot for several years, but then I wanted to, I wanted to be able to combine what I learned in engineering with flying, and because uh, I was just flying, and and I got to thinking about it. I said, well, you know, maybe if I become a test pilot, then I can. You know, apply both of those things together, and so I applied and, and was fortunate enough to get selected for test pilot school. So I went to uh, Abbey Edwards Air Force Base test pilot school. The Air Force sent me for a, a, a master's degree on the way, and I was a test pilot. So I was flying as a test pilot. Loved the job, absolutely loved it. Uh, doing engineering, flying, and, and uh, flying multiple different aircraft, and then uh, I found myself actually eligible for the astronaut program. I hadn't really thought about it. Um, but I had a bunch of friends that were flying, and I got to thinking about it. I said, well, they do kind of what I'm doing as a test pilot, where they combine engineering and science, which I love, and flying, just a little bit faster, a little bit higher. And uh, so I decided to apply, and I was fortunate to get to accept it. And so that's how I ended up where I am. I wanted to apply for the military when I was in ROTC in college, but I didn't have good eyes. It's still not that good. And so I, I became an infantryman in the Army. <laughs> but I always wanted to fly. 
and I don't know exactly why. While I was assigned to a, a military base in Germany, they had a flying club, so I decided to go and learn to fly. I learned to fly over there and got my private pilot's license. When I came back to the States, I discovered the GI Bill would pay for more of my flying training, so I, I used that to help me get my instrument ready. And then I just was a good general aviation pilot. But I found it was expensive to rent airplanes, and I started looking around for other things, and I discovered the world of experimental airplanes, home builders, that you could build your own airplane. And I thought about the BD-5. Luckily, they went out of business before I invested any money in it. <laughs> uh, and then I came to Oshkosh in 1980, and I walked down the line, and I saw a very easy. And I said, wow, if I were going to design an airplane, that's what it would look like. And so I got interested, then I found out they had a little bigger version, the Long Easy, and I got the plan, started building it. So today I fly a Long Easy that I built, and I've been flying it for 27 years, I have lots of time in it. And I've had the chance to fly a lot of other aircraft, some through the military. I got to go to the Navy Test Pilot School as an engineer and fly a lot of their airplanes and helicopters. And I got to fly with the Army in helicopters, not as a pilot, but as an engineer. But I got a lot of training from my buddies. And, I flown with a lot of fellow astronauts in the 238, where they they coached me and gave me some some uh, training and helped me to be a better pilot. And that's kind of my flying background. I still uh, today I fly a Cirrus and I'm going somewhere, uh, but I fly for fun in my long easy. And I still spend an awful lot of time, like many of you do, puttering around my hangar, working on my long easy, or just finding something else to make it better. All right. How about Paul? Well, yeah, I can say I, I started flying when I was 13, I think, and um, got the opportunity to do, uh, to help rebuild a couple of J3 Cubs, and we worked on them every, every couple of nights, a couple, couple nights a week, and for every two hours that we worked on them, we got an hour of flight time for gas and oil. So I had my college license when I was a junior in high school, went to the University of Minnesota for an aeronautical engineering degree, I had my commercial ticket, and then... Um, I planned to go to work uh, uh, just up the road at Malanka, up in, in Alexander, Minnesota, and, and, and I heard that they'd gone bankrupt. And, and um, I saw this opportunity posted on the bulletin board to uh, apply to NASA for, as a co-op. Well, crushed because I wasn't going to be able to design and build airplanes, I figured, well, I'd take my second choice and, and do this NASA application <laughs> as a co-op student. And, and they accepted me, so I went down to Houston. and. Um, they threw me into this operations group, which is mission control. I asked later on why they put me there rather than one of the engineering disciplines, and they said, well, you were a pilot, and I was working my way through college as a scuba diver. And they said, so you really do know what it takes to put your own pink body on the line, and we want you to make those kind of decisions. So I, I was in mission control uh, for a dozen years as a flight controller, and then for 20 years as flight director. But all this time I was flying, I, I had a Yankee for 20-some 20, 20 years, and then I got into this uh, RV-8 project that I really loved. And now in my hangar I have the RV-8 I built, the RV-6 that, that I, I met my wife because she had an RV-6. We built an RV-3 together, which is a single-seater. Um, and then we, uh, we built a uh, big old bush plane, a Dream Tundra, and then recently I built a little jet, a little single-engine jet we had here two years ago. So, um, so all the time that I was doing mission control, I was spending an awful lot of time at the airport tinkering with airplanes, and, and that's really my, my first love. And I think I think when people say, you know, oh, you're a space nut, I say, well, I'm really not a space nut. I'm an airplane nut. The shuttle was the fastest, highest flying airplane ever built. I'm shocked you weren't spending more time focusing on our missions. Yeah, I was in a while we would do that. I mean, you know, I was either at the hangar or I was in the control center. So yeah, I had the exact same thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it all worked out. You might explain a few things. <laughs> the truth is finally revealed. Okay. All right, uh, Paul, I do have a question. Um, you, you talk a little bit about this, but how did your aviation experiences influence, um, and how do you think it influenced your performance in mission control, uh, particularly during shuttle? Well, there's no question that, that being a pilot, being in aviation, loving everything aviation influences the way you interact with the spacecraft and more importantly with the crew. In the, in the early days of rocket, rocket aircraft at, at Edwards, um, they developed the idea of mission control when they were flying the X-15, basically, and they would have a flight director who was one of the pilots um, 
uh, that wasn't flying that day for the F-15. And so you've got this very good connection between the ground control and the crew. And then the early flight directors in Apollo, a lot of work were military pilots. Dean Franz was a military pilot. Chris Kraft was a flight test guy. Um, and so we always tried to have that rapport with you guys, if we could. Um, and and it's, it's important, I felt, for the guys in the cockpit to know that the guys on the ground had some understanding that, that knew that we had some understanding of what we were asking you to do. Okay, now here's kind of a, a softball question, but it, it still will be a lot of fun. So, um, not many of us, except some of the people on stage, have experienced this, but let's, let's walk through liftoff. Uh, what is it like, you know, the night before, what's going through your mind, uh, in the moment of? And, and Paul, you can also elaborate on this from, from your perspective as somebody you know, as the flight director, someone helping to control the first stages of the mission. You know, if you have, you know, someone else who was launching, I was usually pretty nervous about uh, watching somebody else launch into space. Um, when I was launching, it was always pretty cool. The crews were black, pretty well uh, calm and relaxed. Well, it was a little bit of the banter for you back and forth, usually in the, maybe the hot bit was, uh, and that's made the nervousness train that's showing us. But I think that that's the intense year of that training cycle and us have as prepared as anything all the time so ideologically as well as others like that procedures so you do there's so many things and it's just one thing seen in time on the block seems that's what the bike you're trained but until the middle of that point of course that everything different they're really calm but up it and then inside the camp is very calm it's pretty yeah so that i guess i'll say well obviously Prepared well, as a crew. Start the night ago. You've been there. You're in Florida. You're training. Uh, you've been through editing for a week. We now, the medical uh, the week before quarantine. Primarily, I always protect us against this launch. It's cold. It's like that. You don't want to slide up in this place. So, our medical quarantine, uh, we send uh, basically pray from our friend and our family, our immediate family. Uh, the only people who could really see us when we were down in Florida where our spouse would And so, um, we would, you know, we were ready to go. We usually did, we had a place called the Beach House, uh, out of Kennedy Space Center. And uh, that, when we were in quarantine, that was the only safe place we could go besides crew quarters, which is like a, you know, it's like Hotel California. You can check out anytime you want, but you can never leave. Uh, <laughs> but we could actually go to the Beach House. And so we'd go to the Beach House and, and meet our spouses. And so we always did this thing the night before. We say goodbye to our spouses for the last time. Uh, we called it the kiss and cry, uh, and uh, so then we would leave them. And it was actually that was a difficult thing for the families, and, and you know, to say goodbye and knowing that you got to go do this, uh, do this thing. You get up the next morning, and, and we're also at the end of a sleep shift. We are sleep shift for most of the flights. You get up the next morning, and uh, and you're like I said, the crew's pretty relaxed. You get up about I think about well, kind of depending on the sleep shift, but you know, a few hours before you're going to suit up. They have your suits there, you suit up, um, you head out to the launch pad, and they actually strap you in about, uh, on the space station missions, like three hours prior to launch. And so you're on your back, and what I always tried to do, uh, and I flew, always flew in the pilot suit, the commander suit, I tried to completely relax in there, knowing my job, and I, pretty much every flight, I took a nap when I got strapped in. And so I just, I just fell asleep for a while, and I woke up, and then, then Everything's pretty calm, everything's pretty slow, until about nine minutes prior to launch, and then, and then it gets crazy. I'm glad you were able to sleep. Usually, <laughs> you know, when, you're, when you're in the shuttle, you're laying on your back with your feet up. It's like laying in a straight back chair uh, on the floor. And for some reason, that makes you need to pee. And so I never took a nap, because I was always fighting the, the need to use my diaper. Just use it. Just use it. Yeah. it was, that's so hard psychologically. The hardest psychological thing is being in your it, it, By the way, it, and he's absolutely right, because you actually start fluid shifting uh, when you're laying on your back with your legs up like that, so we wore the diapers. But uh, you had to get over it psychologically, otherwise you're going to be sitting there in pain for like three hours. And so here's how I got out. Here's how I got over that. When we were, we were in astronaut candidate training, we had, we had to suit up and go into the mock-up and, and, and do a lot of stuff with the suits. And uh, I had a bet with one of the guys in my class 
that I could pee before he could. And, uh, <laughs> so so we're, we're suited up and we're in the pre-brief and then they're talking about what they're going to do. And, and he and I have like three cups of coffee. <laughs> and uh, and so I think uh, I I don't remember who won. I think we kind of tied, but we both got over. It. So that's that's you know if you ever decide to train and do that, that's a little tip for you. So so Paul, did you and uh, and, and Mission Control have the same kind of thing? You guys well, were slamming coffee and you, well you know and before launch you could pretty much get up and wander out of the control center and back out to the restroom, which is just outside the door. Uh, once once we launched, it was intense in the control center. I mean, everybody's looking at data. Data. Everything happens in eight and a half minutes, and then and then it gets a little bit slower. So you're constantly doing that. But before launch, um, we had what was called the pre-launch planning shift. You guys were always asleep. I mean, you were sleeping. And so the pre-launch planning shift, the control set, the control is all down at the cape. They're in charge, and they've got a checklist that's about this thick. And I kid you not, it's called the OMI. And then we've got a flight control team in Houston who's following along. Pretty much is just following along, but there's a couple steps when we did what was called the abort light test. So, you know, when you get into SN, if there's something goes wrong, we would we would call an abort, and there's a switch on the flight director console that we you arm, and then you push a button, and that's all. Everybody thinks that what that did was it told the computers to abort. All it did was light a light in the cockpit that told the commander to abort. So that confirmed the voice call that said we're going to abort our TLS or tower or whatever. Well, we had to test that. And the way the cape worked was incredibly precise, line by line. And it, it, it would say, flight, you know, Houston flight, I'll arm, the, arm the switch, you know, arm the switch. And then it would be Houston flight, put, push the button, and the astronaut who's in the cockpit, one of these guys' teammates, they asked him, uh, what did Katie Sager? Yeah. 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 Was in the cockpit and they say, abort my A is on. Right? And if you made a mistake during that time frame, everything came to a halt because the cape never proceeded. You, there was no, oops, I just made a little error. I'll let me fix it. Oh, no. If you made an error, everything stopped until they determined exactly how the error occurred. The only thing that a, that a pre-launch flight director could do was screw up and become absolutely well known at the Cape for screwing up. And so it was the highest stress period in the control center pretty much prior to T-minus nine minutes. And the asset guys never saw that, but it, 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 it